All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the final talk of our four-part summer series, Collective Liberation. I'm Tiffany, the Executive Director of Combatants for Peace, founded in 2006 by a former, I'm sorry, if I just said I was the Executive Director of Combatants for Peace, I meant American Friends of Combatants for Peace. Uh, founded in 2006 by a former combatants who chose to lay down their arms and join hands to stop the violence and injustice. Combatants for Peace is a joint Palestinian-Israeli community working in solidarity to end the occupation, discrimination, and oppression. Guided by the values of nonviolent resistance, we are showing ourselves in the world that there is another way. American Friends of Combatants for Peace is a diverse community of U.S. and international activists, including all of you, um, working in solidarity with combatants for peace. So we created this series for the summer to help our community explore the intersectionality of systemic oppression in Palestine and Israel and around the globe and the intersectionality of how we get free. <clears throat> the series is rooted in the tradition, the traditions of the civil rights movement in which leaders asserted, nobody's free until everybody's free Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And as we help to liberate each other, we liberate ourselves. Today's topic is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Solidarity. Also, as you probably read the way we put it, BIPOC Solidarity. We are honored to have speakers Ida Shibley and Elder Jackson III and our moderator, Aziz Abu Sara. Ida was born to indig uh, indigenous Bedouin tribes of North Palestine. She became a political activist at a young age and is an expert on the connection between inner work and outer peace work. She's a leading figure in the nonviolent resistance movement of Palestine and has worked for decades to end cycles of injustice and political violence worldwide. She's a core member of Defend the Sacred Alliance, a movement rooting activism and sacred actions. And she leads work for the liberation of women and for the restoration of indigenous, indigenous knowledge and community. Eldra is the co-executive director of Inside Circle, a nonprofit that was born out of a race riot on the grounds of New Folsom State Prison in 1996. He is a writer, public speaker, mentor, and advocate for criminal justice rehabilitation and at risk youth. He leads work to reduce recidivism and all forms of violence in prisons and communities. And he leads talks and programs that help men address the impact <clears throat> of toxic masculinity on their lives in the world. And like Ida, he's an expert on bridging the inner work of healing with the outer work of peace and justice. Aziz is a Palestinian peace activist from Jerusalem, a journalist, social entre entrepreneur, and politician. In recognition of his peace building work, he's the recipient of the Goldberg Prize for Peace in the Middle East, the European Parliament Silver Rose Award, the Eisenhower Medallion, and much more. He was named one of the most, uh, one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the Royal Strategic Center in Jordan, and won the Intercultural Innovation Award from the UN Alliance of Civilization. On top of all this, he is one of my board members, and he is the co-founder of Mezji Tours. So if you plan to come with Lindsay and me to Israel and Palestine for our tour next year in January, um, we are doing that tour with his company. Quick housekeeping, um, we will leave room for questions during the talk. Um, you can send your questions to the two profiles that say uh, send questions here. That's Lindsay and Caitlin. And with that, I would like to hand this over to Aziz. Thank you, thank you, Tiffany, and thank you everyone for joining us. And I think this is an incredibly important conversation because it rarely happens. We rarely talk about indigenous rights and in, definitely in Palestine, it's, it's not a conversation that happens a lot. I grew up in, in Bethany, Jerusalem, just one of the suburbs, Bethany, which we had a Bedouin community. And even among Palestinians, this was an important conversation to have that we often didn't. 
So I want to start, instead of going deep into um, just what is the indigenous communities and the collective liberation between the Black community in the U.S. and Palestinian community, I want to start of asking each of you, our speakers, Eldra uh, and Aida, I want to ask you to tell us more about yourself, what it brings you to this work, and share with us, you know, how did you end up focusing on supporting liberation in your work? And we'll start with uh, Eldra. Thank you. Uh, huh. So a little bit about myself. I am uh, the co-executive director of the nonprofit Inside Circle. And what we focus on uh, at our core is empowering system impacted people to uh, effectuate change from the inside. And oftentimes people, when they hear system impacted people and they think about uh, empowering them to bring about change from the inside, they think about bringing about change from within prison from behind walls. And, and for us, it's really about the healing and the inside that, that we speak about is inside of the person. We have a, a tagline at Inside Circle, uh, hurt people, hurt people. And, and I was one of those people. You know, I, was, I, I served 24 years of a life sentence in the California prison system. And a lot of my actions were things that of course I needed to be held accountable for and they were things that were uh, from trauma. They, they, they were things that were born from deep-seated trauma. And a lot of that trauma happened, you know, as uh, uh, in my childhood as, as a young person. So, you know, I was running around in a grown man's body and I was responding and reacting to the world and other people from the emotional standpoint of a six or seven-year-old child. And so that's what really brought me to this work is getting to get into relationship with myself and through this work, understanding how we as people, how I as an individual can have things going on inside of me that I am not aware of and I can show up in the world from that place and how I show up in the world can have a tremendous impact on other people. Sometimes that impact can be positive and oftentimes that impact can be very negative, not just for myself, but for those around me. So that's what brings me to this work. And, and we do this work all over the world now, attempting to create spaces where people can realize true freedom. And, and for me, and, and, and what we've learned with our organization is that freedom begins truly within. Thank you, thank you, Eldra. And Aida, can you answer the same question? Thank you, Aziz. I, I'm enjoying that you're saying my name correct, Aida, with ah. I live like among white people and people who do not speak my language often. And so I'm often Aida, 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 or Aida. And so when somebody call my name correct, I feel my ancestors jubilating. So shukran, Aziz. Okay. And um, thank you also for addressing the whole topic of indigenous people and the, how relevant this conversation nowadays. So my, my share of the story, I, um, as Stephanie mentioned, I, uh, I was born into the uh, Bedouin tribe of, of Northern Palestine. And as you can see, I'm born into a female body. And I um, noticed already from the beginning that um, my identities, that the ones that I did not choose, the ones that were given to me, being born into a female body in times of patriarchy and seeing already from a very early age how a male body of my brother um, was preferred by the family more than me. And understanding that, whoa, um, I'm, not, I'm not even crawling yet and I'm already discriminated. And then I grew up and I understood that by my identity as Palestinian, as an Arab, as Bedouin, in times where an Arab and a Palestinian under the Israeli occupation is stamped from the beginning as not only discriminated, but, but, but even being an enemy, being the other, being something dangerous. So I even didn't speak the language yet and I'm already stamped as, as, as a threat to the uh, dominant system. 
being in times of um, born as an indigenous person and having a different dialect and a different way of living, a different way of dressing, and seeing that my Palestinian society was also rejecting the Bedouin people, was rejecting the indigenous people because everybody wanted to go to modernity, to, to buy the plastic dream of being modern, being, um, being new, uh, being uh, born into the Islamic faith and um, in times of Islamophobia. So already from very early age, I understood that all my identities that was given to me are not wanted. And how, how do we deal with rejection? How do we deal with uh, being born with these big eyes that want to love and want to live and want to give and exchange? And from the beginning, we are marked at something else. So all these rejections um, taught me to uh, search the roots of problems. So also, I go back to my name. Aida is coming from Eid, which is celebration, but also comes from Auda, going back to the roots. So my, my story and my, the, the personal trauma that was on me because of my, all of my identities led me to uh, try to understand more and more these systems of oppression and how do they come together? How do they create for us diff different scenarios in the world, different details? Like in Israel-Palestine, it's about Israelis and Palestinians, but it's never about this. It's about how these systems of oppression are manifesting themselves in each place of the world in a different way. So out of my... Uh, I can say the source of my motivation to engage in personal transformation and collective liberation was my love. I, with all the rejection that I felt as, a, as an individual and as a collective, as a collective identity, when I felt into my body, into my spirit, into my soul, I could just feel that an enormous amount of love to people, no matter who are these people, to life, and a wanting to live and a, a, an inner image of life that it is meant to be a paradise, meant to be a love affair, meant to be something joyful. So, so I had to work with these two contradictions, being rejected and being stamped from the beginning as an enemy, as something not wanted. And from within me, there is a force of love that is not allowing me to accept that reality. So that, that brought me to a long life of resisting, but also with the time I understood that I need, instead of resisting, I, I have to be the master of my life by creating, co-creating -create, with the divine and with mother earth, the life that I want. Yeah, and this brought me into the whole topic of bringing the indigenous topic back to, to the Palestinian liberation movement, back to uh, land-based communities, uh, back to us taking power for our life and our engagement with life. Aida, if we can continue into this line, and you mentioned the challenges you faced growing up, and one of those challenges is the existence of the occupation. How does that intersect with indigenous rights? How does it affect indigenous rights? Because we talk about how it affects Palestinians in general, but is yeah. there a place where it really intersects and affects your right as an indigenous person? For sure. Uh, let me, I will answer this um, question, but I, I want to take another loop because I, I, I always would like to uh, focus our, uh, our eyes also as Palestinians uh, to, to the inner. I, I want to say like when I grew up, in the first intifada, um, as a Bedouin and as a um, as Bedouins who survived a huge trauma of the Nakba of 1948, like the the majority of our tribe was 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 uh, was killed, was massacred, was uh, still the trauma is still raging in in our people. And nevertheless, we kept our way of life, our way of being with the land. And in the first intifada, there was this calling from uh, the resistant movement, come and let's unite. Let us reject all the divisions between us and let us um, confirm or make one, uh, one identity, one Palestinian identity. And I, as a feminist, believed them. And I, as, as a Bedouin, believed them. I said, OK, let us leave, put aside our feminist rights and our indigenous rights and let us go together for one identity. 
it maybe it was right for a certain time, but for the long run was was wrong. Because what was wrong is that we as Palestinians and as many resistant movements, we lost the ways of life of indigenous people. Indigenous people main way of life is being connected with Mother Earth, knowing not knowing life from 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 the bases we are pe indigenous people all over the world i mean we are four to five percent um, of the world population but we are ca taking care of 80 percent of the biodiversity of the world five thousand rare uh, languages are are within indigenous people so indigenous people know the ways of being with life the ways of power with and occupation is is another um, example of many systems of oppression where it's power over and so we wanted to resist the occupation power over by the same tools of the occupation resisting what exists but we for, we did not take um, our ways of living and i think today our main way of um, resisting and co-creating a different life that goes with life is moving from power over to the whole dimension power with power with life and by this um, integrating and um, yeah taking again um, our ways of indigenous ways of living with land with life with earth so where occupation intersects is the, the places that we are seduced to move from a we, a tribe consciousness, a community consciousness into individualism consciousness. That's the, the, in the essence of uh, systems of oppression is this separation from the overall life, from the others. We, uh, we are uh, sold uh, uh, one hero story, an individual story of success or failure, um, systems of oppression, be it patriarchy, capitalism, white supremacy, um, white modernity, um, colonialism mainly separates us from the essence of life and from the togetherness with other people, creates categories of us and them, of us and an enemy, and whenever we buy into that dichotomy, that separation, we are in the stools of the master, which will not dismantle the, the house of the master. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you. And we'll get back to it in a bit. I want to yeah. move back to Aldra. And Aldra, mm -hmm. in the last few years, you can see the Palestinian liberation movement and the Black liberation movement kind of starting to do stuff together, whether you go to a protest even here in the US or you, even events and so on, social media, you can see a much more intersection between these uh, two movements. Can you tell us how you see that intersection? How does it work together? Do they work together? I, I, I see the movements, number one, yes, working together. And two, the way that I see them working together is that there, there, there's a co commonality of historically being othered. You have a, an, an entire group of people being othered. And out of that, unfortunately, you know, what, what we see on this side, and, and I think I see it across the aisle, is we're losing an entire generation to hopelessness. There's an entire generation who believe because of the state that they've been born into that this is just the way it is. This is the way it always has been. This is the way that it always will be. And they have resigned to that fact. And, and, and I get the opportunity to work with a lot of young people and they're scared to dream. We have young people who are afraid to dream because that is just one more thing that can be taken and can be trampled on. And they have, you know, they, they, they've gotten to a place where uh, uh, living to the ripe old age of 25 is really a pipe dream. Not a lot of young people think that they will live to see, you know, uh, a, a quarter century of life. And if they do, there is a ceiling in which they'll never break breakthrough so the the uh the intersection is that you have 
two groups of people who are desperately in need of something. There are some people who speak to, well, what we need is freedom. What we need is liberation. What we need is land. What we need is reparations. And, and those things, though they may be true, they may be a part of the solution. What we need is healing, in my humble opinion. Because if we get all of those things that we're talking about, and we've not gotten to a place where we are ready to really receive those things and come from and act from a healthy place, the cycle will continue. So uh, 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 violence is has become the norm. Death has become the norm. Despair has become the norm. Homelessness has become the norm. Uh, addiction has become the norm. Things that should not be normal for human beings are things that we have found a way to rationalize and normalize, and it continues to create a situation of virtual zombies. Ultra, do you see the Palestinian liberation movement being noticed in the Black liberation movement? Are they, are like, I look at it as a Palestinian and I think it's very present mm -hmm. whenever there's a protest, whenever like there is some kind of joint struggle. Is when you look at it or when the Black liberation movement looks at it do they see the same thing or is it just because i'm palestinian i can see it because it's my you know it's my cause oh no we definitely see it when 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 i you know watch the news and i read news reports and i i've been i was born in in 1971 so this is something that you know was a part of my growing up i grew up in the cold war era my dad was in the military so i was around the country where all we had was you know the military channels so, you know, seeing folks in the streets uh, 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 with slingshots and, 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 and throwing rocks and bottles at tanks and warplanes is akin to being over here with folks marching across bridges in Selma and having dogs set upon them and having to go against the military. It's exactly the same. There, there's no way that we can look at that any different. And when I look at it and people that I talk to in this movement, when we look at it, 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 it comes down to people just wanting to be seen and treated as human beings. So there's no way that we cannot see the intersection. There's no way that we cannot see and feel the pain and feel a kinship. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I want to move to another question, which, which kind of goes into the same, in the same thought in, in the civil rights movement, one of the main themes that existed was it's a joint struggle. And not everyone necessarily supported it, but some people looked at what was going on here in the US and said, this is not just a black versus white. This is not, we all shall, shall stand together against any system of oppression rather than saying, well, this system of oppression favors me therefore I don't care or it doesn't affect me and there's this concept that that really developed in the civil rights movement that basically said well if you're not free then I'm not free as well whether I'm white whether I'm black whether I'm brown it doesn't matter who I am I'm gonna have to stand with you because that injustice against you doesn't make me better doesn't make me uh my privilege isn't good for me when I see my fellow human being being treated the way they are, mistreated, uh, demonized, dehumanized. And we see similar things happening today in Israel and Palestine. We see some Jewish communities that has been present in protests, have been present in joint resistance, have been even in the protests happening in Tel Aviv right now, there is this group that always uh, saying we're not only fighting for our own democracy, we need to fight for both, for Palestinians and Israelis to be equal, to be the same human beings. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about your thoughts, your wisdom of how can we get first your, your thoughts about what I just mentioned, and then how can we be free together? How do we 
work together against those systems and not whether you are from the group of the oppressor system or the oppressed, how do we come together and work work together as one group? Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's very challenging to do that. Um, so I'll start with Eldra and then we'll move to back to Aida. Oh, certainly. So, you know, when 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 you speak to uh folks who supposedly uh benefit from a system of oppression. You, you, you can look anywhere in the world, be it the U.S., be it in Palestine or wherever, you have people who are the beneficiaries of system of oppression and they live in prison. They live in gated communities. They live behind walls. They have armed guards. There are checkpoints. There are all of these sorts of things that to me are not signs of a free society. They are not signs of liberation. They are not signs of utopia. I lived inside of a physical prison. And when I go to some of these places where you have to check in with the guard and they uh, have to open gates and they have to raise barriers in order for you to move and they have all of these checkpoints, that's just like behind the wall. That's just like Folsom Prison. So just in that piece right there, the way that folks have to live in fear of something is a lack of freedom, is a lack of liberation. So you are oppressing people and you are keeping them in a particular place so they cannot move. And the folks who are allegedly uh, benefiting from this system are in a self-imposed prison. Everyone's movement is 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 limited. Everyone's freedom is li is limited. Everyone's access to uh, being whole, healthy human beings is being infringed upon. But that's something that, that that we don't necessarily look at and and speak about. The way that we are going about trying to overcome this is reaching across the proverbial table to work with and be of service not just to the folks that we, you know, obviously uh, 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 are supposed to care about, but to the so-called oppressors as well. And to give you an example, when you go into a, a, a prison setting, you have folks that are doing time, you have folks that are uh, 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 convicts, prisoners, inmates, whatever you so choose to call them. And then you have the folks that whose, whose, whose duty, whose job it is to uh, maintain the safety and security of that institution. Prisons are very violent. Just like, you know, when, when you talk about the th things that are going on in Palestine with the normalization of violence, you have folks who go home to their spouses every evening after watching and witnessing and being party to the sorts of things that happen in that environment and they don't have anywhere to decompress. They don't have anywhere to deal with that trauma. Correctional officers and police officers in this country have some of the highest rates of suicide. They have some of the highest rates of domestic violence. They have some of the highest rates of divorce. They have some of the highest rates of depression. We just had a mass shooting here in this country in Orange County last evening where four people were shot and killed. Three people were shot by a gunman. Then the gunman was shot by police. Six other people were critically injured and taken to the hospital. The shooter was a former policeman. And this was a, ca a case of domestic violence. He was looking for his ex-wife. So what we do when we go into prisons, when we go into these correctional settings, we offer to sit with not just the folks that are housed there, we offer to sit with the folks whose job it is to work there. Because if we're working with the people who are housed there and they're beginning to heal and they're beginning to live from a different place, a more holistic place, a more humane place, but the people who are in charge of their custody and care are creating a health community. We're not, not creating a place where people can heal and, and get ready to reintegrate into society. So we have to be willing to work with everyone. We have to, I have to be willing to see all human beings as just that. It doesn't matter what the uniform is, what the title is, because those are just ways that, uh, 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 those are occupations. Those are ways that people have chosen, you know, to uh, 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 earn a livelihood and put money on the table. They're still human beings. 
And until I'm willing to acknowledge that fact and see the other side as a human being, they don't know how to do it. So I have to model what that looks like for them. That's just one solution. That's just one way that we're going about trying to tackle this, this huge problem. Aida, uh, what's your thoughts about the idea of this joint liberation between the people who come from, th that benefit from the system of <laughs> oppression and those who are hurt? And in some ways, we both are hurt by the same system, just in different ways. Yeah, very good question. And like the starting point of, um, is there somebody who's benefiting from the system? Um, good question. Um, I don't know if a person who is, uh, as um, Indra started to answer, by the way, I'm also born in 1971. I hope you're not also in November. We are exactly having the same biography. Um, I, I like just one sign of intersectionality, all the, t uh, the things that Indra spoke, I would also answer them as symptoms of who's benefiting from the system and who's not. Because if I would focus on the story in Israel-Palestine, the fear, the, 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 the complex of fear, how it is activated and how it is um, presenting itself in the, it, it's, it's actually amazing. Me, Palestinian, making observations on the Israeli um, uh, society and witnessing the level of stress, fear, um, double standards, closed heart, domestic violence that is going on whenever there is a political escalation between Israelis and Palestinians, you have spikes of violence in the weekends. And the explanation of it, it's exactly these soldiers and policemen who go in the weekend to their beloved girlfriends or mothers or sisters, and uh, you are um, putting a young boy into a system where he has to close his heart during the week and shoot Palestinians and go in the weekend and make love and be respectful to his mother and be kind and sensitive to his sister. And uh, what happens actually that that split of the heart is not possible and domestic violence in weekends is, goes spikes in, in Israel exactly during political escalations against Palestinians. Who benefits from a system that is oppressing life? But in the end, there are people. There are systems are not uh, something virtual. Systems are people. In the end, there are people who are manifesting, operating, operationalizing the systems. So in the end, we have to come to the question of good and evil, <laughs> binary of good and bad. Is there people who are benefiting from the system? Yeah, there are unconscious people who are benefiting from the system. How can we move from this place of when the majority of people are being harmed by the systems, all systems of oppression, how can we move towards um, more liberation? I think it's um, this place of uh, understanding the, how fear is misused in order to keep people in trauma how fear is actively um, used in the Israeli society to maintain a narrative of victimhood while oppressing another people. We have to look into unprocessed traumas that happen to these people and to every person who was traumatized, as Indra said, hurt people is hurting people, will hurt people. And, and where, where to start the, the healing, where to start the, um, yeah where to start the healing. It's a big question for me as Palestinian in times where the, our, the internal violence and the crime in, inside the, the Palestinian um, society is rising to, um, to places that I don't know it as an adult. And it breaks my heart to see how we did also internalize the, the, the ways of the system and start killing and using um, this uh, weapons that are sent to us by the system, by the same occupation, and we are using it. So how much violence is not processed? Um, the schizophrenia that is, is happening in people who are benefiting from the system, but living in fear, <laughs> the split of the heart, how to answer this? Big, big questions, and in my work, 
it's mainly creating spaces where people can meet each other and listening to stories, listening to the place where we are all harmed from these systems. And I think that um, if, if we observe it also now in Tel Aviv, I mean, I, I observe it with a grain of salt. I do see many people rising for democracy, but we Palestinians are saying that democracy that you had before is not what we really want. We want a radical change. Few signs here and there are linking the lack and the, the, the um, uh, losing that democracy. Um, they are linking it with the occupation, few, and they are rising more and more. And I am, as a Palestinian, I celebrate every flag that rises and make the connection between the two. My hope is actually comes on people, victims of the world, unite and unite in consciousness, unite by taking our back to us. And instead of fighting the systems within the ways of the system, actually creating systems that goes with life. And yeah. that's why I go back to indigenous communities, based land-based communities. We want to boycott Israel and we want to boycott um, the occupation. First, let, let, let's uh, um, uh, do our food, let's harvest our water, let's create alternative ways of local societies that lives accountable. And in these places to raise consciousness. My hope goes also to many Israelis and Jewish people who are joining the movement and um, understanding that them joining the, the collective liberation is not an act of goodness, is not a charity, it's a duty. It's a huge duty to use your privilege in a, in a responsible way to change the situation. Ida, one, um, one more thought uh, I just want to dwell on that you brought up. You mentioned the recent protests in Israel. And I wonder how much that is, you think, affecting joint liberation work, bringing, do you think some Israelis or more Israelis are looking at what's happening and saying, oh, that is the same system, the same system that says, oh, these Palestinians are bad, are now saying, well, anybody who disagrees with us be Palestinian, yeah. be Jewish, be yeah. whoever you are, you're bad. Your rights are not yeah. as important as mine. I think yeah. the, Israel, the Israeli minister of, uh, of police, of uh, security, internal security, just said it honest, openly yesterday on television. My right trumps everybody else's rights. He, he's not even yeah. shy about it. My rights come first. Yeah. Do you think that is making people saying, oh, wait, yeah, we used to benefit from this, but it's coming back to bite us now? Or you think people are still in denial? For sure, there are still some people in denial. And I look into the, the more people that are rising and understanding and connecting the dots. And I believe that uh, with the movement of information and with the, the, the milieu, the global milieu that is happening today, more and more people are awakening to connecting the dots between that system will eat will eat some part and in the end it will come to you <laughs> there is this buddhist uh, prayer that says I, I don't quote it now correctly but as much as i remember it, that it says first they, they came to take the jewish i was not jewish i didn't um, uh, uh, um i was not against them then they came to take the homosexuals i was not homosexual so i didn't rise and now they come to take me who will rise and, and that's, that's the systems. They will take uh, parts, they will take parts. And unless we come together and understand that these systems are against life and we, we, we do our actions with life, then we, we will lose it. And unfortunately, sometimes I feel that us human beings, we don't, um, some of us cannot uh, take uh, uh, lessons out of choice. Some of us need to be forced. And I think today the, the, the global situation of drought, of climate change, of climate crisis is, is forcing us to understand that we cannot go along, we cannot go more into this denial, into this, um, some are benefiting and others not. I think we are coming to a very big potential collapse that needs us all united without any difference between us and them. I, I count on people who raise their consciousness 
for, for choice, because choice is liberation. Love is liberation. If any movement or any action that we are doing is coming from calculation and us and them, we will also lose. Also us, uh, we think we are alternative movement. But if we don't come from radical love and radical choice, we won't lead into liberation. And so my love told, tells me that uh, there are more and more people rising and connecting the dots. And I still believe that in my lifetime, I will still see something total global shift. Um, and it, it has come from our consciousness. Thank you. Um, all right. I think it's time to start getting some uh, some questions from everybody. So if you have any questions, please send it to us. And I have already a question here that says, how can, this is from the audience, how can we support this fight for freedom? So let's go for both of you. Eldra, how can people listening be supportive of the work you're both doing? Hmm. I get that question a lot. And <laughs> for me, the, 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 the answer is it, it starts with the individual and doing your own personal work. For me, it starts with doing my own personal work. You know, yeah, I am a part of a nonprofit and the work that uh, combatants for peace, you know, they could always use funds. But again, money will not solve this. Resources will not solve this. Me as an individual looking internally at me, because even when I think that I'm right and I feel like I'm on the correct side of an issue, I can easily fall into the place where I start to do and be the exact thing that I'm fighting against. I can start to cast judgments on other human beings. I can start to look at other human beings as less than. I can start to see other human beings as the enemy. So I have to always constantly be aware of what's going on inside of me and what it is I'm projecting into the world. So to be a part of this fight, to be a part of this struggle, I invite everyone to look at themselves to go inside and find out who they are and get in touch with their humanity. Because from that place, I am able to be a part of the solution and see the humanity in other people. That's where the answers can and will come from. Thank you. Aida. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. I would say what Ildra said, this is the foundation. Um, if, if we want to change the uh, the course of things, we need to change our dream, the dream of our culture. And it starts from personal change into, uh, yeah, into moving into liberation. So uh, when I, I, if I would break it down, well, uh, um, then it would go to this place of see that your actions and your life is with life. See, how do you um, share resources? How do you use your privilege? How, how many of us, um, a few people who are with privilege can use them to amplify voices of unprivileged people? How can we use the, the privilege that we have to create different uh, bases for other people who are act in, in action and in a very severe way suffering from the, the effect of, of oppression? I think like when I work with, with um, Bedouin uh, uh, communities in, in the desert in, in Palestine, and my main work is actually creating uh, eco villages in Palestine. I would love people who have the, the knowledge, the, the how to do, the, the privilege also of money, of, of, of media, to join such movements and empower people who are doing actions for life. And when I say actions for life, is actions that are really listening to Mother Earth and what is needed. And so there is a lot to do. I, I would say the main support that I, I would love to, to engage people in is uh, look around you and see what is the first step to do toward liberation around you, in your surrounding. After you finished with yourself and your, your family, look around. Look around and you will see the first um, cycles of the effect of systems of oppression. Uh, Eldra, I have a question for you here that asks about your thoughts about the rise of Christian Zionism among African-American churches and how we in the U.S.-based supporters of Palestinian liberation might engage with them. Say that question one more time because I want to answer correctly. 
Someone's asking, they love to hear your thoughts of uh, uh, the rise of Christian Zionism among African-American churches and how U.S.-based supporters of Palestinian liberation might engage with them. Hmm. Again, it's uh, <laughs> separation. Separation, it, it, it divide and conquer one when, when I see things like this, it is a, a, a divide and conquer, you know, open spaces for groups, invite them in so that we can separate and so that we can divide. Again, for me, it, it comes down to humanity and seeing the light in other people. It doesn't, for me, it and the people that I work with, it doesn't matter uh, 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 whether it's Islam, whether it's Zionism, whether it's Christianity, atheism, agnostic, whatever it may be, having the ability and the willingness to see the light in another human being is always going to be the answer. It's always going to be the answer. So engaging other human beings by asking what it is that they need and being open to listening and hearing, because what we find in this work is that most folks, we're having this discussion and we're continuing to have these discussions throughout the generations because of fear because everyone is 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 usually functioning from a place of fear scared they're going to lose something scared they're not going to get something scared that if they give something up whoever gains it will utilize it against them so opening the lines of communication and listening we will hear how much more we are alike than we are different yeah i i agree and i, I just I'm thinking about that and I see a lot of Christian Zionism starting actually through travel. People come to Israel, they do see the holy sites and they don't really get to see any Palestinian often on, on their trips, especially Christian tours that are very much designed to, to only get you to see the holy sites and that's it. And you leave and you think, this is this is great this is fantastic and slowly because of that tour people start moving toward i'm going to support one side mm -hmm. israel because they must be all right i was in israel loved it everything's fine didn't meet any palestinians and it's just that that's the challenge we have is being able to take those stories that people often don't hear and mm -hmm. bring it to them stories like the ones we're doing today how do we engage with these people bring those stories they'll i believe we'll have a recording of this have have them hear somebody like ida have them hear somebody like eldra and realize there's more to what you see on television there's more than what you hear on your tour where you meet only one tour guide who'll tell you whatever they want to tell you and you don't have the background to to know more yeah. um I got, I got another. Oh, go ahead, Eldra. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, you know, briefly when 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 you talk about you, you know these different isms, those and 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 viewing sites, going on tours and seeing things, and all of those things are very beautiful, and that's not a representation of spirituality. The part that is missing that that you didn't mention in there, and that a lot of people don't latch onto, is the spirituality. The yeah. connection to that one, the connection to that thread that runs through us all, that is not a sight. That is an indisputable truth that goes beyond time. So, you know, inviting people into that connection, inviting people into that space authentically is very difficult not to see, you know, the, the light in other humans. Amen to that. Well, uh, Ida, uh, we have a question here about how do Palestinians or do Palestinians accept uh, the Bedouin community now, the indigenous community? What's what's your integration within the Palestinian community? And do you see a change in that in the last few years? Do you see a movement that indigenous communities, Bedouin communities are more accepted? Thank you. I don't think that the, the starting point that the Palestinian community doesn't accept the indigenous communities. They are part of the Palestinian community. What, what, was, what is not um, well taken care is that to recognize actually that indigenous tribes, Bedouin communities are holding knowledge 
that is important for our liberation now as Palestinians. And it comes from ways of solving conflicts, ways of being together, restoring togetherness, that um, the move from individualism to togetherness, the, 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 the mentality of tribe, there, there is a, a negative uh, looking into the mentality of the tribe and it's for, for truth, like there is the, the many of us run away from patriarchal tribes. So I, I speak to the positive mentality of the tribe. We know now more and more from indigenous uh, tribes all over the world that only tribes will survive. It means only those who know how to live in togetherness, in sharing resources, in being together. I think the Palestinian uh, society, because we are under such a pressure for so long, for so long, so many battle, bat battlefields are open and many of us don't know where to engage because the trauma and the oppression is just so acute. You don't have time to rehabilitate. It's just so acute all the time. We are counting dead people all the time. And so it needs some of us to engage in a deeper research um, and, and see, so, so how do we integrate back? So in the last eight years, I'm really focusing a lot into uh, integrating indigenous uh, knowledge in back to the resistant movement. And there are more and more uh, ears that want to know so how do we go back to our ancestral knowledge? We knew once how to live in abundance. How do we go back to this? Um, so I'm also using my privilege of, um, of not living sometimes in Palestine and being far away from the active wound to allow myself to be in a research, to be in collecting data, to uh, creating spiritual spaces where I connect with my ancestors and I ask them, so how did you live? What was there? The other point that I think that um, is very crucial in, uh, in us Palestinian people is the internalized racism that we have. I, I am really honored that we speak about uh, people of color and black movement, um, um, intersectionality and uh, collective liberation, but this will not go from my disc without addressing our internal racism. And this point, um, looking into our uh, black Palestinian people. How do we deal with each other? How, how that internal racism that we have, the internal racism that we have toward the indigenous and Bedouins, many of us, we are still looked down to them. And this with, I have patience because I'm Bedouin. <clears throat> I have patience that this will also change, but it needs education. It needs that we, um, yeah, we, we raise this uh, voice again and again of how much the, the indigenous group uh, tribes all over the world, especially in Palestine, is holding a treasure for us. Our history is the future. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'll just say to everyone growing up, not part of the Bedouin community, but living very, very close, uh, because in Bethany, we were very close to the Jahalin tribes and other, other Bedouin tribes. And I remember when we had some conflicts in, in the area, usually people used to go to one of the leaders of the Bedouin tribes and ask them to judge on the issue. And that was a very common way of conflict resolution. And Bedouins usually used to be known are as the best judges. Uh, they would know the tradition and it's not, but mm. often people think it's an Islamic law and it's oh, not no. really, it, yeah, Islam has got into it somehow, but it's more traditional. I, I think some of it might even predate uh, Islam. Yeah. So sulha. This is you are speaking about the sulha. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm also teaching about sulha, and it's, it actually dates much before Islam. And it's uh, an amazing way of conflict resolution, of um, acknowledging the pain. And I, I think if we would use sulha as a collective uh, method of peacemaking in Israel, Palestine, we would do a lot of uh, progress, maybe much more than all these uh, things that we are doing. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're coming to an end because we reaching our, our end of the hour and we have still so many questions. I'm sorry, we won't be able to take all of them. I, I do though wanna just touch on one question. I'll, I'll say my thoughts about it and then I'm gonna pass it to 
Tiffany, I do want to thank you, Aldra and Aida. It's always amazing to hear from you. And thank you so much for joining us and being such strong supporters of the work of combatants. And I think the question often that comes out, you look at everything that's happening over in Israel and Palestine, or even sometimes here in the US, and there are moments you look at organizations like Combatants for Peace and you say, can we really make a change? And it's it's very hard because things are not going great right now. If you look on the news at any point, you might feel very hopeless. But I think what we have, to me, what, what keeps me at least going on is we trying to make a change. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. But the alternative is accepting this nonsense of violence, systems of oppression, um, being doomed to hurt and kill and fight each other, destroying our own communities, which is, as Ida mentioned and Eldra mentioned, eventually that violence goes into both of our communities, all of our communities. It affects everyone. And so, yeah, there are moments where we feel, are we doing enough? Is it making a difference? that the hard work we have to do is to grow, is to get more and more people to do similar things, to get more and more people doing what Ida is doing, what Eldra is doing, to work together more. And that's why we, we're bringing these kind of conversations and encourage our friends, our families, everyone around us to be active, to do something, to be out, to support these organizations. Um, and you being here, I know everyone who decided to join us today, you being here, you already doing something to make a difference and not just accepting it, um, reading the news and feeling terrible about it. I think we being together, encouraging each other, at least we're trying to make a difference. And hopefully I know we will prevail. It might take longer than we like it to be. Injustice cannot last forever. And I'll pass the mic to, um, to Tiffany. Are you around? Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, this does conclude our final talk of our summer series. Um, you know, as Ida and Eldra spoke about this internal work and um, so much about, there's so much even with Aziz who's sharing about listening to each other. Um, I do wanna encourage all of you who are able to come with us to Palestine and Israel in January. Um, please do come because so much internal work happens on these trips and so much connecting with um, diverse communities and deepening relationships and forming new relationships and seeing a new reality, um, confronting some of the things that are difficult and touching so many reasons to unite and hope together. Um, that is what we will be doing. And um, so I do hope that you will join us for those who can. Thank you again, everyone, so much. Ida, Eldra, Aziz, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today and for the lights that you are in the world and the healing and the goodness you are creating. Um, and to all of our supporters, have a wonderful rest of your week. Can't wait to see you when we launch our next series and hope to see you um, in January. Take care.